Amen. Come on, can we give Jesus a hallelujah and give him a shout of praise? Man, wow. Amen. Man, what is going on, Team Challenge? How are we doing today? Man, I'm so happy to be back here this year. I'm so happy to be in the house of God. Man, if you don't know who I am, uh, neither do I. Uh, my name's Alberto, and uh, man, I get to pastor an incredible church, but I'm a Teen Challenge alumni. Uh, thank you, yes. September will mark 19 years that I walked through the doors of Los Angeles Teen Challenge. And uh, I had never been to county jail, but when I went through LA Teen Challenge, I got a taste, ladies and gentlemen, so I just want to... I almost got my tear drop tap. But anyways, that's for another day. Hey, I've only got about 25 seconds to preach, so we're going to go ahead and just uh, jump right into this. But really quick, man, I'm just so blessed by some of our incredible staff. We brought some of our lead staff, Nathaniel and Pastor Kyle, our associate pastor. If you could just show them some love. And I know that they have been such a blessing. But I want to dive right into this. Hey, if you're taking notes, uh, the title of my talk is Not Good Enough. And if you're not taking notes, you are being judged. And um, we're going we're gonna to look at the book of Judges, and we're going to look at the story of a man by the name of Gideon. If you're not familiar with Gideon, I hope and believe that after this message you will be. But we're going to look at Judges chapter 6, verses 7 through 18. And this is what the Bible says. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites, and he said... This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who have oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and I gave you their land. I told you that I am the Lord your God and that you must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. Verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Orphra, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Albizar. Gideon, son of jo man, talk about tongue twister. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Verse 12. Now the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say that the Lord brought us up outfitted from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and he's handing us over to the Midianites. Verse 14, stick with me. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But the Lord, Gideon, replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. Now the Lord said to him, I'm going to be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as you were fighting against one man. Gideon replied, hey, if you're truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it's really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. He answered, I will stay here until you return. Hey, let's go ahead and pray real quick. Lord, we thank you for today. I thank you for this time. I thank you for everyone in this room. I thank you for the incredible words that have been spoken prior to me being in this room and the great words that are going to be spoken after me. And Lord, I just pray that the very words that are being spoken in heaven would be spoken here in this room in this atmosphere. And Lord, wherever we are at on this journey, whether we're new to the faith, new to the program, we're apprentice staff, it doesn't even matter, Lord. At the end of the day, we're sons and daughters. And wherever we're at, I pray that you would speak to us and that your word what do what it does best, and that's reap a harvest in our lives. May I become less, and may you become more. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, really quick before we dive into this, I wanted to share a story with you guys. It was about, I don't know, 15 years ago, no, I'd say about 12 years ago, I started having these horrible headaches. Every day I had a headache. Every day I had a headache. Every day I had a headache. And I would tell my wife that I had a headache every single day. And finally, my wife said something to me. She says, honey, I said, yes. She said, I think that you need glasses. And I looked at her and I said, I think that you need glasses. And she said, I already have them on. So anyways, that was just a... So I went to go get an eye test, and I had never, I haven't done this since like the fourth grade, right? So I go to Lenscrafters, my first mistake, and I go look at, uh, go get my eyes checked. And so they're checking my eyes, and then they dilated my pupils, and they told me that I'm going to need glasses. And after they dilated my pupils, they told me, why don't you go ahead and pick some frames out? So I'm walking in the storefront. I can't see a dang thing, but I think I can see stuff. I'm walking into things, and I'm looking at these incredible frames. And then one of the employees comes to me, and she says, 
says, sir. I said, yes. She said, are you looking for glasses for your wife? I said, no, I'm actually looking glasses for me. She said, you're in the woman's section. And I said, well, you dilated my pupils. And so anyways, I digress. And so I remember they gave me a prescription. She said, come back in two weeks when your glasses are going to be ready. So I come back in two weeks, and I'm kind of excited about the fact that I get to wear glasses. I still wear them. I'm not wearing them. I can't see anybody, but y'all look great, okay? And I remember I went, and I sat with the doctor or whatever, and she put, she told me to put the glasses on. And before I put them on, she said, hey, listen, it's going to take your eyes a couple of weeks to adjust to this prescription and to the glasses, so you're really not going to be able to see really well, but you should be able to see pretty good. And so I put the glasses on and I was so excited like I had my eyes closed and then I put them on and opened them and oh my gosh the minute I opened them I could not see anything I'm talking my vision was blurry it was worse than what I started with and I told her that and she said no it's okay it's supposed to be that way and I'm like oh my gosh and so I took the glasses and I wore these glasses for a month y'all I could not see anything for a month my eyes didn't adjust to a dang thing I was blind I couldn't I couldn't see anything. I was driving and I couldn't see like one car looked like three. And I thought that it was going to go away. But what happens was is I went back to the doctor and I told her what had happened. And she looked at the glasses and she was able to assess and she said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, what are you sorry about? She said, I gave you the wrong prescription. And I said, ha ha. All right, thanks. God bless. No, I'm just kidding. Right? And so here's the reality. Everything that I saw through those lenses Everything that I looked at was extremely distorted. My perspective was distorted because the very lenses that were placed upon me were causing everything that I looked at to be distorted. Friends, I'm here to tell you that you have to be careful how you view your life moving forward and how you view yourself moving forward, that the only lens you look at your life through is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that everything you look at would be through the lens of the kingdom of God, because if you are not careful, your past experiences... Your circumstances and your situations will be the false prescription that you carry for the rest of your life. And although you say Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you can't fully live it and walk it out because you can't fully see it because you're blinded by the perspective that you've allowed in your life. Are you still with me this morning or this afternoon? See, we find Gideon in this place where he has this incredibly distorted perspective of his life. The angel of the Lord appears to him and calls him a mighty warrior. And you have to understand, Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press and he's below ground. He is hiding from the Midianites and the angel of the Lord appears to him and tries to call him to more. Tries to call him into greater. Tries to speak life into him and he struggles to believe that he is a mighty warrior. He struggles to believe that God is with him. He struggles to believe that he can do anything great from God because of his circumstances and his situation from his past and his present have distorted his perspective not only on God but his perspective of himself. You know, I I share that with us because I think that oftentimes we struggle to view ourselves from the perspective of heaven. What do I mean when I say the perspective of heaven That we struggle to truly see ourselves the way that Jesus sees us. We struggle to see ourselves the way that God truly sees us. Let me tell you something, my friend. When you truly have the revelation and it permeates into the depth of your spiritual DNA, when you truly understand whose you are, you know who you are, and you walk differently, you talk differently, you think differently, you praise differently. But you have to understand how heaven sees you. And I don't care whether it's your first day or you graduated 27 years ago. This will always be a cross that we have to carry and something that we constantly have to adjust. In the same way that my prescription adjusts every few years, we have to do our best to get in alignment and adjust our perspective and always bring us back to the centrality of the gospel. That's a good place to say amen. So what is heaven's perspective of us? Well, this is it, that you are children of God. We know that, but do we comprehend it? Listen to what 1 John 3, 2 says. Dear friends, we are already God's children. When you say yes to Jesus, when you say yes to Jesus Christo, right? Amen. I'm not, you know, I can say Jesus Christo, but whatever. Anyways, you now become a child of God. 
Listen to what else he thinks about us in 1 Peter 2, 9. For you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into the wonderful light. And he doesn't stop there. In Deuteronomy 28, 13, it says the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you will always be on top and never at the bottom. I started from the bottom, but baby, now I'm here. Bless God. Man, when you understand that you are a child of God, when you understand that you are a royal priesthood, when you understand that you are the head and not the tail, when you understand whose you are, you walk differently, you live differently, you talk differently, when you really allow that to permeate. You see, my children, at a young age, they don't have to worry about anything because they know who their poppy is, and because I'm their poppy and I love them, I'm going to care for them. My son is never going to walk into the kitchen and say, but Father, do we have enough funds to go to Costco this week? Where I would say, son, because of you, we never have enough funds, but we will make a way where there is no way. <laughs> my daughter, I got four kids. That's how you know I'm Latino. So now my daughter, Asuka, right? Alex ain't the only Cuban up in here, you know what I'm mean? saying? <laughs> my daughter never comes and says, Dad, are you going to be able to pay the PG&E bill today? My other little four-year-old doesn't say, oh, are you going to keep the roof intact? Are we going to have a place to stay? They don't have to say that. They don't have to worry about that because they know that their poppy is going to do everything that he has to do to take care of them. And if that's the earthly father, think about your heavenly father. He's already got it figured out. You've been in the program 30 days and you're trying to figure out your career. You've been saved two months and you're already trying to figure out your pathway to being a pastor, which is great. But some of you in this room, you're so worried about so many things that really you should not be. That if you would simply seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the Bible says that he would add all things unto you. You don't have to worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough worries about itself. Just worry about today. Worry about what he wants to do in you because he wants to do something so profound through you. That's a good place to say amen. amen. Why do we struggle sometimes to view ourselves from that perspective? If I could just be completely honest, I'm sharing this as a heart message because when I graduated the program and I went to TCMI and went on staff at TCMI and became a pastor, man, I struggled so hard to really view myself through the lens in which God viewed myself because I felt like being an ex-addict, I always carried the scarlet letter. I felt like because of my past, because of what I had done, because I went through Teen Challenge, because pastors knew about it and leaders knew about it, that I always was the castaway. I'd walk into rooms and get asked where I went to Bible college, and when I say I went to the Teen Challenge Ministry Institute, they would say, that's not a Bible college, and I would say, your mom. But nonetheless, I digress. <laughs> there was jobs that I did not get because I went through Teen Challenge. There was rooms that I wasn't given access to because of my past. But see, my God says that he chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And baby, I was a fool. I'm still a fool, but I'm a fool for Jesus. And so I'm no longer ashamed of my past. I've accepted in it, but I don't live in it because I walk in the grace and the freedom that Christ has given me on the cross. And so you, you got to be careful. Let me save you some time. Let me save you some years of feeling like you have to prove yourself, feeling like you have to prove to others that you are validated when you've already been validated because of Calvary. So the question is, why do we often struggle to view ourselves through that lens? It's because your perspective is always related to your experience. Perspective is related to your experience. Although we have a new mind in Christ, although we are a new creation, we have this little thing called the brain and where we constantly are referencing our past and our circumstances. And although we're saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, we still reference our old behaviors, our old experiences, the abuse we went through, the addiction, the rejection, being casted away, and we still try to walk this new life with an old blurry lens. And so your perspective is connected to your experience. Look at Gideon. We can see it right here. 
In verse 13, he says this. Drink a cup of water. (laughs) If the Lord is with us, then why has all of this happened to us? See, Gideon is connecting his experience with his perspective. The angel of the Lord appears and says, mighty warrior, God is with you. God, if you are with me, I mean, if you're really there, why has all of this happened to me? Why have you allowed all of this to go on? Why have you made me be the least, not even the least, not only the least of, my, of the tribes, but the least in my tribe? If you're a God who is with us, if you are Emmanuel, where were you, Emmanuel? Because he's associating his perspective with his experience. Some of you are there today. Some of you are struggling to believe that God is truly with you. That God has really called you into a new life and has a purpose for you and a plan for you. Even some of you right now, you're struggling to believe that God is for you because in here everything is great, but everything in your home line is home life is exploding. Everything around you outside of this place feels like it's collapsing. And some of you have said, God, I gave my life to you. I came to Teen Challenge. I'm giving up a year. Why don't you fix my stuff? And God said, why don't I fix you, worry about you, and I'll take care of what's going on on the outside. I'm with you. Just because you're sober and you're clean now and you think that everything is going to be done in your time, beloved, it doesn't work like that. It happens in my time because everything is beautiful in his time. His time. So you got to be careful. Are you still with me this morning or this afternoon? Good grief. What time is it? Gideon demanded so many signs because he had been so crushed by the Midianites. If you're really with me, do this. I don't have time to read. If you're really with me, do this. Some of you... <laughs> Uh, Just respectfully, because I just came from Nashville, and I've been praying for you for three days. But I believe that some of you are, God, if you want me to stay in this program, give me a sign. (laughs) Bubba, you was on drugs, and now you're not. What greater sign do you need? You've been delivered. You've been healed. The chains of bondage and addiction have been broken up. Do I want you to finish? Eres o te Which one is it going to be? The only sign, my friend, that we ever need is the cross. That is the only sign because by that cross, by his wounds, we have been healed. By his death, we have been forgiven. And by his resurrection, we can have life and life forevermore. If he did nothing else, the cross was enough. But yet he continues to pour out his love through his Holy Spirit in your life. Uh, My question to you is what past or present experiences have caused you to maybe have a distorted perspective on God. Some of you today, you you need to take off some lenses. You need to to cast it off and, and choose to see your life through the incredible promises that God has for your life. See yourself the way that heaven sees you. It doesn't, your past doesn't define you at all anymore, but you are, we are, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. You can walk in that freedom and live in that freedom. And I share that with you because that freedom will try to be taken from you every single day by the person who we call the devil or el cucuy. He will always try to get you to think that you are not who he says you are because he is a deceiver. He is a liar. He is the father of lies. And he has been a murderer since the beginning of time. So he chooses to lie to us and we choose to believe those lies. Some of you in here are being restrained and being held back by nobody other than your thoughts or a thought that you've been carrying, a thought that you've been holding, a thought that God has said, I want to redeem that area in your mind because I have given you the mind of Christ. And so you have to be careful what thoughts you entertain See, but I believe that Gideon's outlook on himself was something that was learned. It was adopted. He said, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Somewhere along the line, he didn't just wake up one day and realize, oh, I'm weak. So is my mother and father and my abuelita and my abuelita. Everybody, we're all weak, bless God. Somebody told him that. 
Somebody transferred that thought process to him. Somebody gave that and handed that baton to him as somebody had probably handed the baton in previous. It was a generational curse in a sense that was handed down from generation to generation. But the Lord said, the buck is going to stop with you, Gideon. You are not the weakest in your family. You are not the weakest in your child. You are a mighty warrior, and I'm speaking that over your life so you can hand that to the next generation. If you are a father in here or or a mother in here, maybe the buck stops with you, that every generational curse God is breaking through you and in you. Be careful, be careful that you do not hand down those negative traits and perspective to your children because you have the ability to build them up or break them down. You have the ability to break generational curses and leave a new legacy, but it's up to us. That's why perspective is everything some, maybe somebody spoke some words over you. Man, I grew up in the era of your mama jokes. Anybody remember that? I'm not going to say any of them because you won't believe that I'm saved. But when I leave, I'll make one in the car. Bless God. But do you remember a time when things would happen and you would say, well, I'm rubber. You're glue. Whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you. That didn't work. Everybody that said that in the playground is now in therapy, including myself, Right? That was like our coping mechanism. We're like, I'm rubber. <laughs> Words hurt. Words have the power of life or death. We can speak death over someone or life over someone. And here's the interesting part, that we shall be held accountable for every word that we have spoken. Be careful and mindful of your words because your words carry weight. Dead weight or they give life. But I believe that there's some of you in here that you had a word spoken over you and it wasn't a good one. Somebody told you that you weren't good enough. Somebody told you that you were worthless. Somebody told you that you were a worthless mother and a worthless father. Somebody told you that it would be better off if you were never born. Somebody told you you're probably not going to finish this program. Some of you have been holding on to some words that have been spoken over your life from a young age. And without you probably even recognizing it, maybe until this moment, you've been carrying that word deeply embedded within the back of your mind that has taken root in your heart that has caused you to live the life that you lived. And if you're not careful, create those patterns, even being saved. I'm here to tell you that every word of negativity that was spoken over you, I break in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and I speak life over you. You are a great mother. You are a great father. You are a son. You are a daughter. God will use you to be a pastor. He will use you to be a missionary, an evangelist. He will call you to the ends of your, the earth because he chooses the foolish things. Do we got any foolish things in the house of God today? Worship team, if you can come up and give me some, some Kenny G or some Luther Vandross on that so they think I'm closing. I'll take some pads if that's cool. Some of you have, we got to stop giving the devil so much real estate in our minds. we got to serve him the eviction notice and tell him it's time to go. You've overstayed your welcome, my friend. I know we're in the state of California and we love hoarders, but not in this cabecita, my friend. It's time for you to go. You've got to go. Some of you, it's been condemnation and insecurity. Let me tell you something. Being a pastor for a few years, for some time now, they've always said that the biggest issue amongst pastors is pride. We're pride that this pride is pride, this pride, pride holds us back. And I think that was true probably five years ago. But I think that the greatest sin coming up in this generation will be our insecurities. That if we're not careful and if we don't learn how to manage our insecurities, our insecurities will manage us. And in the kingdom of God, there should be no insecurities, but there should be complete security in who Christ has called us to be, who he's created us to be in Christ Jesus, that we can walk with confidence in all that we do. You know, you know what I love about the Apostle Paul? It's very interesting to me. It's not even in my notes, so I, it's either going to hit or not. But in any ways, the Apostle Paul, when he talks about the spiritual armor, you know, Paul could have used any illustration or any analogy to compare spiritual armor to. He could have used anything, but he used a Roman soldier. Paul, why would you illustrate the depths of the spiritual things of the kingdom of God and compare it to a Roman soldier's armor? 
I don't know if these are disciples. I've studied that, and you kind of break that down. I think there's a certain reason when, when Paul says, hey, listen, you need to stand firm. Like a Roman soldier with, with all of the armor on, you need to stand firm. Why did he use a Roman soldier as an illustration? Because you have to understand something about Roman soldiers. The reason that they could stand firm, the reason that they could stand so confident is because they knew who they represented. They knew who was beside them, behind them. They knew who was beside them, and they knew who went before them. So they had the courage to walk in confidence. Beloved, you need to know who stands behind you you who lives in you and who goes before you he is the king of kings he is the lord of lords he is the alpha and he is the omega he is the beginning and he is the end and he occupies all the space in between it's time that we walk more confidently not arrogantly but confidently and boldly and that you stand firm in your faith believing that he's got something for you believing that there is a purpose for you being in this room, whether you sit there with your arms crossed and your eyes rolled back of your head, God can still speak to you. That he's got a call over your life. And lastly, I close in this. Gideon, as Gideon was getting ready to go, He's got the courage now. He's got a little bit of confidence. God's, God gave him like 953 signs. He's like, okay, God, I see that you're with me. You want to give me one more? Okay, my bad, my bad. God says, if, if it wasn't enough that Gideon was already the least, his tribe was the least of the tribes, and he was the least of the tribes that was the least. So that wasn't bad enough. God told Gideon, okay, you're going to go take the Midianites, but your army is too big. God, what you talking, man, you blind, what prescription you got up there? What kind of lens crafters you guys have in heaven? He said, your army's too big. I need to cut your army. You need a, you need a what? He says, Gideon, this is what we're going to do. You're going to go down to the water area, the little river area. And he's like, you're going to make two sides. You're going to have a right side and a left side. And Gideon, what's going to happen is, is the guys are going to go drink water. Now, Gideon, the guys who get down and pick up water in their hand and cup it and lap it like a dog, you're going to put them on one side. But now Gideon, the ones that get down on the ground and they put their hands and their knees to it and they start drinking like this with their head down, those you're going to put on another side and those are going to be the ones that you're not going to take. You're going to take the ones who sat there and cupped the water and came up and drank it in such a way. And you're like, well, what's the significance of that? You see, the ones who put down on the ground and put their head to the river, those were ones that weren't looking around. They weren't looking for Gideon's best interest. They weren't looking for the interests of the army or for the people. They were concerned about themselves and themselves only. And God said, Gideon, I can't let you go to battle with these people because they're a liability. They're dead weight. Instead of them helping you progress the mission, it's going to cause you to regress. But now the people... Now the people that went up and grabbed the water and they drank it like this were men that were looking around. They were conscious of Gideon's leadership. They were conscious of the brotherhood. And they looked around to make sure that no enemy was around them. He said, now those men, ha ha, that's your circle, dog. Now that, that's, you need to get some, you need to get some, some fellas. Gideon, that have your best interest at mind and at heart. Friend, I'm here to tell you, as you step into everything that God has for you, that you better make sure that the people that you keep in your circle are going to be people that edify you, encourage you, and lift you up. Your circle will either expel you or it will propel you into the kingdom work that God has for you. Do it in mind standing to your feet. Who's in your circle? Even now, I close one more time. I know they gave me 25 minutes, but if I drove four hours to be here, I'm going to give you a few more. <laughs> If I sat on the, bro, and I got to go back to Bakersfield, you know, I'm going to take like a camel, an Uber, a donkey. I got to, I remember, I remember when I was in Teen Challenge, literally I walked into the doors of Teen Challenge and the front yard was Linwood, the backyard was Compton. 
Oh my gosh, that can become a rap song. <laughs> Drake, Kendrick, get out of the way. Here's Birdo, right? <laughs> and then I, 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 I knew I was done. I was done, man. I don't want to go back to the crap that I was in before. Who does? Why would I want to go back to that and think I could do it differently with the same tools and no resources? And I was done, and I, 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 made, I made a decision. I, I, my worst day in Team Challenge was better than my best day in the world. Come on, what's your worst day? You got GD for talking in a quiet hallway? Oh, my God. We didn't get to use the phone for a week. Bubba, you didn't have a phone when you was on the streets. But I digress, I digress. And I said, I'm, I'm, I went to Riverside, man, and I was like, man, I, I don't know, I'm gonna turn this place upside down for Jesus, man. And I remember that there was a scripture about, you, you know, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And the, 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 there's a scripture about taking the scriptures and binding them around your neck. And so, so I was such a dork. I ended up taking this lanyard with these index cards and I put them around my neck with these scriptures on me. And whether I was in line at lunch, I would be reading them. Whether I was in breakfast, I would be reading them. My man right here, whatever I was, I'll be in the bat, never mind. But nonetheless, cochinos. I would sit there and be reading. And I remember I'd have guys come to me and be like, bro, what are you doing? That's so dumb. Oh my gosh, you're so dumb. We got scripture, huh, huh, huh. I said, get behind me, Satan. I am the head and not the tail. I bind and rebuke every spirit that you're bringing up against you. <laughs> I would get made fun of. And you know what, man? You know what I realized? You got to be careful what circle you surround yourself, even in a Christian context. Just because they love Jesus doesn't mean they love you and the mission that Jesus has for your life. Learn that now so when you go into ministry, you don't have church hurt and you burn out. We got to stop using that. Well, I can't believe you can't. Well, you you want to be like Jesus. Judas, Judas shows up in your room and now you're trying to figure it out. Do everything you can. Do everything you can to get all of Jesus while you are here. Do everything you can to get everything to Jesus. Know that you are wonderfully and fearfully made. Know that he has called you for such a time as this. Know that you are a royal priesthood. That you are his righteousness because of Christ. You, us, me. I believe with all my heart that God for such a time as this is going into the highways and to the byways and he's setting people free and he's raising them up to minister for the greatest revival that we shall ever see. That he is using the whosoevers, that he is using the leftovers, even the leftovers the disciples collected and used. Don't let anything throw you off of the path. Don't let nothing throw you off the assignment. For such a time is this. The time is now. The time is now. The time is now. There is no greater time than the time being right now. I'm going to pray for you. I don't think anybody's going to sing since I already went into the evening service. But if, but if you're ready to say, Jesus, I'm all in, man. I'm all in. Come hell or high water, I'm all in. Come hell or high water, Jesus. Let me pray for you. You say, Jesus, I want all that you have for me. I want to see myself as you lift your hands right now. I'm going to pray for you. That's you, Jesus. We thank you so much. 
that you didn't wait until our best day, which could never even be accomplished, but you died for us willingly while we were still sinners. You gave your life for us. God, you gave your one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And God, you promised to give us life and life to the full. I pray for my family, for my friends, for my brothers and sisters in this room. Lord Jesus, I'm right here with them. God, we lift our hands and we say, Jesus, until the wheels fall off, we give you our lives. Jesus, until the wheels fall off, we will follow you. Jesus, until the wheels fall off, we will go where you send us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, come on, let's give the Lord a shout of praise.